Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. It's Facebook Live for Heal. Here with Peter Crone. The one and only. The one and only. As far as I know. <laughs> Probably a few more of you, yeah, but not it. like you. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> while we are waiting for people to log on, um, we just want to say, hi, Adam. Thank you for joining. Um, we wanted to say thank you for all of you that uh watched our trailer. We got 2 million views and we're really stoked about that. So, so thanks. Thank you for continuing to follow Heal. And, um, you know, the intention of these Facebook lives is really to continue the conversation because there was only so much we could put in the film. And as you all know, there's so much to explore when it comes to healing and human empowerment in general. So today with me, a very special guest, you saw him in the film Heal. If you haven't seen Heal yet, I highly recommend it. Um, so Peter Crone is a pioneer of human awakening and performance. Um, he's also an Ayurvedic practitioner. He works with a lot of professional athletes to get them to their you know, highest level, um, take them from where they already are and take them to the you know, echelon of, of their potential. Um, and I've seen the results. He's, he's really amazing because he can help people free their mind um, so that their highest potential can come through and express. So he is amazing and welcome. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Yeah. Um, okay, so really important to continue the conversation. Um, you know, fear is a big thing. When you get a scary diagnosis um, or if you're just in life and feel hopeless and helpless because the government you know, it seems systemically sick or we don't like the leader in power or uh, you feel like you're trapped at work with a, you know, boss that you don't care for. Wherever we are feeling fear, when we're feeling helpless and powerless, um, how do we break through that? How do we shift our mind and shift ourselves so that we can break through the fear and become empowered and take action to transform our situation? Fabulous question <laughs> and an ongoing human problem. Um, I think when I encounter that with people that I work with, there really is this sort of uh, overarching belief that as human beings, we're victims of our circumstance. So that I feel the way that I feel because uh, the way things are out there. And that leaves me feeling that sense of victimization. And so regardless of what the arena is, whether I'm working with an athlete, an executive, uh, an A-list or a stay-at-home mom or a kid, it's just, first of all, to realize that circumstances are circumstances. And that's not to say that we have this sort of passive view of it um, and feel like we're powerless, but really to recognize the degree to which I feel upset is the degree to which I'm saying I can't be with the circumstance. Like, I'm not free in this particular situation. And as, as human beings, we have this... Um, component of us, a lot of people call the ego, you might call the persona, the identity, which is really under the impression that it knows how life should be. And that's where all of the suffering comes in. So there's this very, very strong DNA driven belief that I'm under threat and unless circumstances change, I'm not going to be okay. And that's really the, for me, the precursor to dis-ease as an internal experience, which then gets manifest physiologically as sickness. Yes, yeah, so that's interesting because our dis-ease is, you know, when life is not behaving like we sh think it should behave or, or uh, you know, circumstances show up that we think should be differently or I feel like I should be at a different place in my life or, oh, no, I got sick. It shouldn't be this way. Why me, right? Mm -hmm. so, so ultimately, you know, ease, what would you describe then as ease? Like what would be the state of mind that you tend to live in, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. um, in the state of ease. Because when people are in stress or they're resisting the circumstance that they're being faced with, uh, that's dis-ease, right? And it ultimately shows up in the physical. So what is, how do we achieve ease? So, and there's a quote by Krishnamurti, who's one of my favorite teachers, who I first discovered when I got into the line of work that I'm doing. He's uh, this traditional Indian teacher, like a, a real guru in the real sense of the word. And he's got a beautiful quote where he says, this is my secret. I don't mind what happens. Now, if you really get that, so some people, they will interpret that as, you know, like you're completely detached from that. Mm. 
But the way that I interpret that and how I live my life is that I really don't mind what happens. Now, that's not to say that I'm not committed to a certain way of living or that I have my own intentions and goals and things that I'm truly like looking forward to achieving. But as life unfolds, there's no resistance to the process. Now, if you really get that to your question about ease, there's, there's an ease about that. Mm. So regardless of what happens, what I'm saying is I'm not, quote, unquote, affected by it. And that, to me, is the precursor to complete freedom, which then psychologically leads to the emotional peace, which then physiologically allows the body to do whatever it has to do to heal. If we're in a constant state of unease, disease, because I'm saying things shouldn't be this way, I'm not where I should be, wherever there's basically the sensation of you're shooting all over yourself, <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be resistance, which creates tension in the body which then ignites the fight or flight response in your sympathetic nervous system, which then will create deterioration of your physiology because you're basically using more resources than you can replenish. Because you're resisting. It's, it's a fight. Like if, you know, if I was to keep clenching my fists over and over, like eventually there'll be muscle fatigue and I'm draining my, my system of its ability to replenish the energy I'm using to maintain the tension. Right. So Which that is, fight is resistance. Like I'm saying, whether it's my spouse, my boss, politics, religion, your neighbor, where, wherever you feel conflict, even with your own physiology, right? If you're in conflict with your sickness, then you're creating tension in your body which is the precursor to sustaining the disease that then manifests physiologically and even behaviorally with, with neighbors. You know, it's, like the, the whole um, love thy neighbor as thyself, right? Like it's a beautiful tenant, but how many people do you know that love themselves, right? Hence why you hate your neighbor. Oh. Right, oops. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, expand on that because you say something in the film, it's like, you know, uh, you know, you're constantly, you're trying to, it's something about beating the shit out of themselves. So like, you know, mm -hmm. you're trying, you look outside into the world and you're wondering why things are so chaotic. But then if we look in, you know, a lot of our times we're, we're judging ourselves and beating ourselves up. So how can we achieve world peace yeah. when we're not peaceful within? Right, exactly. I was going to say, did I actually say beating the shit out of ourselves yeah, in the film? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so, yeah, so basically, you know, these bigger, like, grandiose ideas and ideals that we all strive for, which would be beautiful, world peace, you know, something that gets talked about all over. But, you know, if you look at what is the world consisting of eight plus billion people. So we are the content of the world. And if the content is in a state of dis-ease or in conflict, then the world can't be at peace, right? So if, if you want the whole to represent something, then the sum of the parts has to also, at least the majority has to sustain that quality of experience and energy. Mm. So for me, that's yeah, every human being, as far as I'm concerned, is looking for relief, is looking for freedom, is looking for peace. We're just under the impression that we'll get there when the circumstances are how we feel they should be. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's this perpetual chase, like this idealized future that people believe that, well, that's, you know, when that's all taken care of, then I'm going to be fine. But it's, it's never ending. It's literally that horizon that you continue to chase because you never get there. And that's why so many people, like, and I don't mean this in a jovial way, but like, it's sad that people will get to the end of their lives and realize, oh, you know, I never quite got there. And for that reason, they were never quite happy. Mm. And so for me, the real gift of life is actually being where you are. I mean, it's, it's sort of a little trite now, but like being in the now, being present, people say it. But to actually really get that, like heaven is an experience here and now, it's not when your circumstances are perfected in the future. Because mm. just even logically, when you're never in your future. It's always an idea. Right. And you can, it's, I mean, you can only really control how you respond to life. You're not going to be able to control your circumstances. So to really get to a place where you can be with mm -hmm. whatever's going on and find, you know, so how do you, let's, let's get it back to disease because I know okay. a lot of people are dealing with a condition, whether it's a physical injury or um, a disease, uh, you know, an illness. Mm -hmm. How do people get a diagnosis that's terrifying? How do people you know, accept that diagnosis and then, you know, what are their first steps? How do you deal with the emotions of that? How can you be okay with a stage four cancer diagnosis, say, or a degenerative disease like MS? Like, how can you be okay with that? And what do you do next? Right. So it's a great question. And I think one of the problems lies in the question, right? So when you said a terrifying diagnosis, 
I would even say it's not, it's a diagnosis. The terrifying is our reaction to it, because think about it this way, and we've all heard either stories of this through personal contacts and friends and family, or you hear about them just through indirectly other people. But somebody does get a serious diagnosis, let's say, and then they find out that two, three, four, five months have gone into remission, they're fine, like from now. Mm. So the, when, when, like say an oncologist walks in and he tells you X, Y, and Z, gives you your diagnosis, and it's not what you want. Now, if he was equally to say uh, 24 hours later, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, you're gonna be fine in five months. You know, there's gonna be a little bit of heartache here and there, and there'll be some trying times, but you're gonna be okay then all of a sudden the same diagnosis doesn't have the same impact. Because the meaning changes, or the... Well, it's more the perception of where you're going. See, if, if, if in, my, in my view of myself and my life, my sort of mantra is it all works out. Like everything I want is coming my way. So that even makes room for adversity. I might not understand something that's happening right now that might seem trying, but in the bigger picture, if I step back and do that 50,000 foot view, like this is a, a growth, here. It's an opportunity. You know, like this is a great opportunity for me to learn where perhaps I'm not so free. Or this is an opportunity for me to learn to be more responsible or accountable for my life. This is an opportunity for me to get educated about well, how to better take care of myself. Versus looking at it as a problem, which again doesn't exist in my world, it's just circumstances and then how you react to it. If you can really get whatever anyone's dealing with right now is just the circumstance. And there's an opportunity, not a problem, to deal with either past tense, some responsibility for how you got there, or future tense, commitment uh, to what you want to work towards. Mm -hmm. So w that is really big for me because you have a baseline belief about life yeah. that supports you on your journey so that you can be at ease. So basically mm -hmm. it comes down to... I want to say spirituality in a way, but it doesn't have to necessarily be spiritual, mm -hmm. but it's, a, you know, you kind of baseline belief that life is for you. It's for your greatest unfoldment. And yeah. there may be pressure. Uh, there may be ch challenge, yeah. but that is to wake you up to your highest and greatest potential. Right. Is that, yeah. can you talk about like what, you know, what belief about life? Like, how do you, how are you so convicted that life is always working for you and never against you and it always is going to work out? I mean, it wasn't always that way. I'm going to be straight with you. I mean, I wasn't always in this mindset of total freedom, but that, uh, that was because I went through adversity that I had to get to this point, right? Like it's, I write in quotes, I'm writing my first book. And one of the quotes that comes to mind based on your question is that life is the process of friction that polishes the gem you already are. Oh, just take a moment. <laughs> so, so basically, and there's all sorts of colorful, different, beautiful gems out there. Right, but in order to them for them to make it to Tiffany's and Beverly Hills, <laughs> you know, they've got to get buffed. Like, you know, they are right now, like around the world, in all sorts of mines that we can't see. There are gems, but in order to get to them and excavate them, you have to get through some kind of quote unquote tough material. Mm -hmm. So, it's to like me, the coal and the diamond. Whichever the metaphor you want to use. Michelangelo, block of stone, he La Pieta away. is in, inside. Yeah, yeah, and he chipped away everything that wasn't David. So for me, in terms of our own spiritual evolution, and this is totally a spiritual conversation for me, is that life will present circumstances, people, situations that are for your quote-unquote friction, such that you can be polished to recognize and awaken to your true nature, which is there's nothing wrong with you. So that's why I got to that place where now I truly live and exist in a world where there's nothing wrong. Mm. There just isn't. Now, does that mean everything's perfect? No, I won't say that. Everything is the way it is, but it's not wrong. It would be like me pointing out at the ocean and going, you know, that wave over there should be over there. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. like, it, like it makes no sense right. because mother nature is moving in the way that it moves. And we are part of this system called planet earth and then beyond that the galaxy the solar system the universe and for us to think that we know how things should be is really like not only preposterous but the audacity of that to me like i just relinquished that i'm mm -hmm. like i used to think i knew how things should be you know that person shouldn't behave that way my girlfriend shouldn't have left me my boss should give me more money whatever the situation and then I realized, like, who the hell are you to know how things, like, I didn't get the memo from the universe, hey, buddy, you're in charge. Yeah, right. 
So I just gave it up. Okay. If you're, you know, and that's total freedom if you're into that. If you're into that kind of thing. I think a lot of people that are tuning in are. Yeah. Um, so then what would, like, uh, I guess, should we, should we take a question from the thing? Uh, absolutely. There, does anyone have, have a can, question for us? How have we can help? How have we can help? I mean, basically, talk about, you know, this, this epidemic of inadequacy. You touch on it in the film, but we didn't, you know, get to talk about it because you're, you, you know, as with a lot of these continuing conversation, we, each expert that I interviewed, including Peter, the, the interview was one to two hours long and, and only about five to ten minutes ended up in the film. So you brought up in the interview about this epidemic of this belief in inadequacy. And I know yeah. that that epidemic, I definitely caught that bug as a child, <laughs> um, which is probably why I wanted to be an actor, to be adored and loved, to prove finally that I'm worth something mm -hmm. or whatever it was that drove me. But um, talk to us about the this belief in in inadequacy and what it's how it's showing up in the world and how to kind of become aware of that in our own life so that we can heal that part of us so to me it's actually the actual opportunity of a human right i call it cosmic hide and seek meaning you know we are whether you call it divine beings conscious beings spiritual beings we're a soul like consider our essence is is innately intact like again i don't like the word perfect but there's nothing quote unquote wrong then as a human being, we create this persona, which its fabric, its foundation is inadequacy. That's the game. So I'm extraordinary, but I'm gonna pretend that I'm not good enough. And then the game is, how can I remind myself and get out of that ridiculous constraint? And life will help me by presenting circumstances that confirm my belief until such time they go, oh, I, I made that up at a young age because I've got all the evidence. My dad said this, my mom said that. My teacher said this, this happened at school, this event occurred, you know, even to the extremes of obviously some awful things or very trying things that happen to children, you know, and I help a lot of people through that. But the events themselves don't quote unquote hurt us. It's how we interpret them and then what we use that as evidence to create a, 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 a narrative about ourselves, that I'm somehow not good enough, I'm not loved, I'm not wanted, I'm not safe. These worlds that we create then become the precursor to the things that we do, like you were talking about as an actress, if you felt like I wasn't good enough or I wasn't loved, and then you found the avenue of acting where you got some attention, and that attention, at least for a minute, sort of brought some transitory relief to your fear, but it would never do it enough because that part of you that's trying to get the attention is by design not enough. Mm -hmm. And this is why people are exhausted and why they need to speak to their doctor, and why people do drink and have to use drugs, whether they be prescribed or otherwise, no judgment. But it's a form of trying to escape from your own judgment of yourself. Mm -hmm. Versus my work is to make space for that part of you and realize, wait a minute, there is a part of me that feels not enough or somehow not safe. These are human, human programmed, deep DNA states of consciousness. It's okay. However, for me to hold a space for that part of me, and instead of letting it drive the boat or drive the car, so that I can find some peace and go, wow, part of me really thinks I know how things should be. Part of me really thinks that I'm not loved. Part of me really thinks that I'm not enough. And if you could just imagine that's a child, you know, and there's many of our viewers I'm sure have children, and how many times you see that in your own child, that they feel like they were a failure at school, or kids made fun of them. And, they didn't feel like they did well enough in a test. As a parent, as, a, as an expression of love, you want to hold that child. You, you want to, it's okay. Whatever your form of like love and compassion is. You might hold them, you might play with them, you might tickle them, but ultimately you're letting them be, know, and letting it be known that it's okay. And if adults could have that same attitude to that part of themselves, I know it sounds a little Your bit sort child. of schizophrenic. Yeah, your own inner child and go, wow. How can I hold a space for the part of me as, as me, Peter, I had a fear of loss. And no shocker, right? My parents both died before I was even 17. So my conditioned response to something that was important to me that provi provided security and value, my parents went. That's scary. And so any time that then I found something of value, a girlfriend, a job, a great idea, or money, 
like I would start to hold on to because there was a fear of loss mm. until I got, oh, wow, I'm not losing anything. Form comes and goes. Mm. And if I can notice, oh, there's just part of me that fears loss, what would I do for that part of me? I would just hold it and reassure it. It's okay. It's okay. So um, someone just typed in a question about how, so if, you know, if, if they're in pain, <laughs> in disease, discomfort, mm -hmm. You know, how do they, you know, or a diagnosis that, you know, how do they move through the fear to, how do they move through the fear and switch to a positive so, mindset? So again, by understanding what is fear, fear is a conversation. That's all it is. It's a thought. So really the only thing that's upsetting somebody is what they're thinking about. Like if you really get that alone, you're free. The only thing that's ever upset you is something you're thinking about. Now, you collapse that with an event, a diagnosis, um, a relationship, or something that's actually happening externally. And so if somebody's, say, going for a checkup and they've had some past trauma or past hurt, then that event is going to appear scary. Totally human. That's okay. But that part of them that is scared is under the impression that they might get bad news. Now, that's not – I'm not saying that – it's not going to happen. That's a possibility. But they could also find out that whatever they're scared of isn't going to happen. So for me, that brings back to the point of can you be just where you are and, and this is the hardest thing for a human being to do, live in complete uncertainty. Now, that takes a huge amount of trust. But again, that's where I live from, which is I don't know what's going to happen. And that was where I found freedom. Mm. is the part of my mind that was always trying to figure out, in my case, it was in a relationship, is this girl going to come back? Did she meet somebody else? Will I ever meet anyone who's as great as her? You know, the litany of questions that just firing around Spiral, in the head. Yeah. Like it literally was waking me up at night and not allowing me to sleep in the first place until I got the, I got the answer to all of the questions. And the answer was the same. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the to answer be, to those questions. Be okay with not knowing. And that's a scary place to be. But it is freedom. And it allows suddenly the future that was otherwise full of potentially worst case scenarios to have space, to have a sense of possibility or opportunity where there's nothing there now because I don't know what's going to happen. And then that allows the system to at least find some peace. And then you, you, you're really relying on your ability to deal with things as they unfold as opposed to trying to avoid worst case scenarios that haven't happened yet. Mm. Now, if you really get that, that's how most people live their life. They are trying to avoid a bad future that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And then people wonder why they're tired. Yeah, it's just like constant. I, th I feel like our minds, our, our brains are actually hardwired to kind of look for the worst case scenario out of mm -hmm. like old survival mechanisms. Yeah. So I love how, you know, I, I kind of, one of the messages of the film is let's reprogram our conditioning and our minds to, why can't the, the worst case scenario hasn't happened, nor has the best case scenario. Yeah. So instead of focusing on the worst case scenario, which causes us fear and stress and yeah. resistance and tightness and tension. Yeah. Why, why can't, how do we train our minds to focus on the best case scenario, fantasize about that? At least we're in a, you know, when we're imagining, you know, the, the doctor telling us, Oh wow, your scans are clear or, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're able to walk again or whatever that best case scenario is. Yeah. What, you know, how, do you have any advice of how we can start to reprogram our minds or start to focus on other possibilities other than the worst case scenario that we often go to? I, I, yes, and I think it's less about like training and it's more about awakening and awareness of the fact that there's just a, a inherited condition of being human which is going to lean towards worst case scenario. So there again, it's just there's a part of me that by design, because as human beings we live in this fight or flight survival-based arena or this paradigm where everything is a potential threat, which is old DNA, and just go, wow, wow, there's really part of me that's very strong and very convincing and very persistent that really believes that my future isn't going to work out. But if you really investigate it, and this is why my work, at least, it takes a lot of deep inquiry. If you really investigate it, you will see that there's no evidence for that. Like that you can't actually say that my future doesn't work out. It's a, it's, a, it's a prediction at best. And this is why kids are so inspiring because they don't yet have a backlog of past failures or upset. And so they live from pure imagination. 
Now, if we can remember as adults, that same imagination is available to us, but we have accumulated hurt and trauma that we haven't reconciled yet. And so we think that past hurt is going to therefore inform future fear. So honestly, one of the greatest ways to create this new sense of opportunity for the future is to look at what am I still dragging around with me? What have I not been okay with? What have I not accepted about my history? Because as soon as we reconcile that, then all of a sudden it's not something that we think is going to happen anymore. You know, it's like if I work with an athlete, baseball is obviously a popular sport so people can relate. Like if a guy, one of my guys has struck out, maybe even for a couple of games, so maybe he's like 0 for 8, like he's been at the plate eight times, hasn't had a hit. So it would be very, like, it'd be very understandable if he went up to the next at bat in his third game that he's carrying concern for this at bat. Now, in this situation, it's sort of a zero or one. It's binary. You know, he's going to strike out or he's going to get a hit. But nonetheless, he's going to predominantly lean towards, I don't want to strike out. But now he's being informed by his history, which has got nothing to do with this moment mm -hmm. other than him remembering it and being concerned about it. That the metaphor I use that would be imagining you're driving a speedboat and you think that the direction of the boat is given by the wake. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the direction of the boat, where I'm going, is not given by the wake. That's the history. Right. It makes no sense. Yeah. So so if using the continue the metaphor, if that baseball player and starting with my guys, they learn to go, well, I'm 0 for 8. What the hell does that mean about today? I don't know. But I know what I'm committed towards. And so now they're at least in a place of freedom as opposed to fear. So so apply that to health and a diagnosis. Okay. So uh, let's just, to, to be the at-bats 0 at 8 times, say that you had cancer, you did treatment, and it, you went into remission. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, something pops up in a different area of your body. Yeah. So you're now taking that fear into the doctor and you're, you're reliving all the stuff that you had to go through before. How do you, so you're saying what you're committed to now is health, yeah. right? You're committed now to healing. Mm -hmm. So rather than how do we let go of the fear and the baggage of the past and focus on the healing and not let that fear of the wake spill yeah. over to us? So I think even beyond being committed, because it kind of creates time, right? Like, so if I'm committed to health, in a funny way, I'm saying that I'm sick. Now, I'm not denying that a person doesn't have that diagnosis, but I would assert, and I want people to understand, you are not sick, meaning your true innate self is wellness. Your true innate self is vitality. And because of your choices, your DNA, your genetics, your mindset, your diet, all of these things have contributed where you've changed your quote unquote shell, right? You've got this different experience of your physiology now. So, so I would, in that situation, I would remind somebody, but you're not sick. Your true nature is not sickness. That is on top of. So it's kind of like going back to the gem metaphor. Like, you know, if somebody's like, oh no, look, I'm a shitty piece of coal. Mm. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> You're a diamond. You're a diamond. You're a David. You're just hidden in this yeah. block of marble. And so I think that's a much deeper realization for people to have yeah. is that our inherent, and I make a distinction between our inherent qualities versus our inherited qualities. If you think about something that's inherited, it's on top of what is. Usually crappy. No, I'm kidding. Invariably <laughs> not great, <laughs> unless you have extraordinary parents who are very evolved. Um, but the human journey is, as I said, this cosmic hide and seek. You're going to be put into these constraints so that you can get out of them. It's like Houdini, right? So what have you adopted? What have you believed that makes you feel inadequate, that makes you behave a certain way and then create circumstances that you don't like so that you can undo that? It's like, it's like the ultimate three-dimensional video game. Mm. Now, I don't mean, again, don't want to make it trivial. People are sick. They've got families that are, you know, at stake kids they're worried about. But if you can really look at the bigger picture, there's nothing wrong with me. And on top of that, I have created, not like it's my fault, but through my choices, my behaviors, my diet, my mindset, I've created some imbalance. But I know deep down, I'm okay. Then if I can look at, okay, I can be responsible for, wow, I can see that I've had a lot of anger. I've had a lot of resentment. I still don't like my parents. I'm still blaming my spouse, my ex for my situation. I'm still angry at my boss. I'm still concerned about, you know, what my neighbor thinks about this, that, or that. Like, 
all of that litany of negative thinking, if we can start to be responsible for that and let it go, then again, that is what allows the body to just take care of itself, mm. to heal. The body, the body is always trying to heal. Very hard. That's all it's doing. Yeah. So, it's, so really, it's the question is, what am I doing that's getting in the way of that? Exactly. Right? It's not how can I heal. It's rather healing's happening. To what degree am I inhibiting that? And how can I help? Yeah, how can I support that? How can I encourage it? Mm -hmm. And having, to me, a mindset of possibility, a mindset of like the best case scenario future elicits a state response where I feel at peace. Like again, using the example I, I gave earlier, if that doctor came in and said, oh, by the way, you're going to be fine in five months, that person's physiology is going to be cascaded with relief. Like, oh, thank God, I was yeah. so worried. Well, that is the body's signal of like, don't worry, don't go into panic, don't go into fight or flight. I got this. It all works out. And, you know, that's a beautiful quote I've seen a few people sort of send around where it says, you know, it all works out in the end. And if it hasn't worked out, it's not the it's end. It's not the end. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And that's just how I live my life. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm okay with that. And whatever life brings, I'll deal with or I won't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you and know? you're okay. And I'm okay. Well, speaking of the end, we've come to the end wow, of our great. Facebook Live um, interview with Peter Crone. Uh, we certainly can continue this conversation and will. He has much wisdom to impart. If you want to contact Peter, you can go to petercrone.com. Um, and we thank you all for tuning in and continuing this conversation with us. Um, we hope we answered some of your questions. We saw some coming through. We tried to touch on as much as we could, could but... Um, yeah, just wanted to send you some love. And Absolutely. anyone going through anything, just... Keep believing that it all works out. Yeah. You know, that to me is ultimate faith. Like I, I often joke, I say I'm a trust fund baby. Never got left a penny, but I trust in the universe. Oh, I love it. All right, guys. Thank you so much, Peter. It's been an honor. Likewise, thank and, you. And uh, all of you take care. Bye.